But Mexico is right next to the USA, right underneath it, if you look at the map. It isn't actually underneath, it's all, they're all the same thing there. But uh, I grew up, one of my first experiences with Mexican food was at Prospector Pete's in Buffalo, New York. And uh, I loved it so much that my mom, being Irish, but being a great cook, we got canned tortillas. That's all we could get in Buffalo. There's no, not many Mexican people there now. Great Mexican restaurants there now. Canned tortillas, mix some ground beef and onion, mix it up, got some kind of sauce, and, I, and she was making Irish tacos before, back in the 60s. So I always had a great uh, affinity towards a culture through its food. My wife is Italian, I love the Italian food. Thai food, Buddhist country, intriguing, wonderful place. Their food is unique and special. Japan, amazing stuff. Uh, all over, great food everywhere. So Mexico for me was always, that was my entrance point. Then when I moved to California in 1985, I got very close to a lot of Mexican culture. And it was wonderful. Uh, just the, uh, the Bejo Sexto, the big giant thing, and the Mexican music and uh, laughter and joy and love of family. Uh, just wonderful things for any culture, and Mexico has a lot of that. So I have great respect for the Mexican people because of that. I love the food, uh, and the girls are beautiful too. Well, it's a different band last night than tonight, different song list. Uh, we're doing one song that we did yesterday, uh, Mr. Big's song, Addicted to That Rush. But uh, it was nice to play with some local players, some local uh, Mexican players, and meet a few more of them too. Every time I come here, I meet more and more. And I've been to Mexico many, many times now doing clinics and doing shows with Mr. Big Winery Dog, Steve Vai, Sons of Apollo, a lot of other things. So uh, yesterday's show was good. Uh, the gentleman that I played with, the guitarist and drummer, excellent, excellent players. Um, but uh, Thomas Lang and the other guitarist tonight, uh, they're uh, kind of world pros. You know, they play all over the world. So it'll be a little, uh, a little different in that respect. But I love also playing with people that are new to the game, because they have a new kind of enthusiasm, and uh, the, the gentleman last night certainly did. We had, a, we had a wonderful time, so we're gonna have a good time again tonight too, and uh, doing the clinics also, I think it's nice, because I do clinics because I love to help my fellow musicians, so if I can help any of my Mexican fellow uh, bass players, guitar players, drummers, singers, songwriters, I'm happy to do it. The key probably is most best illustrated by one very simple, word which is relentless I mean, you just don't stop you keep going and uh, I had that uh, tattooed as a sign that that's that's what I do I keep working I get up I pick up my base it's not working too well that means I gotta hit it harder I gotta go farther I gotta play harder dig deeper learn more uh, and I was never interested in being famous or rich I just wanted to play the absolute best I could. And uh, like many professions, if your goal is to be famous and or rich, it's a stupid goal, it's a dumb goal. Your goal should be to do this the most amazing thing, the most amazing burger, the most incredible electric car, whatever. That's the goal, it's not to become rich. So for me, I, I, my goal still is to improve every day. I wake up and I get with my base, I feed the cat, I to get with my base and I work and work and work and work. Discover something new every day that I didn't know before that helps me a little bit more. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased that people uh, occasionally have expressed a positive uh, point of view towards me. I appreciate that very much. But myself towards me, I'm still learning and I got a lot more to learn. Uh, the bass I have, some people refer to it sometimes as stereo. So it has two outputs. When you see two, you think right, left, stereo. But it's not true right, left, stereo. It's high and low. There's one pickup does high frequencies, higher, and the other pickup does lower frequencies. Pickups close to the neck are lower sounding. So that one does the low sound. Pickups farther towards the bridge are brighter as you go towards the bridge. So that gets brighter. Uh, if you look in your stereo, you see a tweeter and a woofer. Uh, try to, if you, if you have an old stereo that's broken or that you don't like anymore, disconnect the, the tweeter and it's just a horrible pull. It's awful, it's terrible. If you disconnect the woofer, it sounds like that, but put them together and it sounds like music. So uh, when you hear my top speakers, it sounds kind of fuzzy and buzzy. When you hear the bottom, it sounds very deep and basic, but put them together and it's a full bass tone. And that's, uh, I loved it because I love the original P bass. 
That's the middle pickup. But I also love the old Gibson EBO basses, which also sounded a lot like the Hofner basses Paul McCartney used. The super deep low end was a 60s tone. And then I wasn't the only one that did it. Uh, many other manufacturers made dual output basses and it configured exactly the same, with two pickups going to two separate amps. So that's uh, uh, Alembic did it. Rickenbacker made the Ricco sound. Use a stereo plug though instead of two. The only reason I don't use a stereo cord is because I didn't know how to wire it. I was about 16 years old when I put that pickup in. I chiseled a hole and put it in. I didn't know what I was doing. And that's how that bass is still to this day. So all the other basses are modeled after it. So anyway, uh, you also uh, asked me about the gear that I'm using. I'm using the Line 6 Helix. It's a digital modeling device. I went to the company and they modeled my personal custom preamp that I used for decades. That was uh, all of ta almost all of Talus, all of Edom and Smile, Mr. Big, all those records were all done with that preamp. And they modeled it and it's in the Helix software now, so if you buy the Helix, you get, you get my preamp also. Uh, that through hard key amps, uh, they're reliable and sound great and rock solid. My Yamaha Attitude Bass, my Rotosound Strings, my Hipshot Detuner, my DeBarzio pickups. So that's about it. Well, you might be surprised that I'm not as partial to shredding as you might think. Uh, the two types of music now, pop and songwriting and prog and shredding. Uh, I was a Beatles fan and I know a very famous prog person also who's one of the biggest prog guys in the world and he was into the Beatles too. And so were all the early prog bands, Genesis and King Crimson. The songs are really everything. And uh, I, I do a bass solo. The original reason for it was for the other guys in the band to go and have a beer while, while I kept working. Uh, so it's not all about soloing and shredding. It's fun, it's an enjoyable thing, but it's, it's uh, without songs, you don't reach the same people. And I would like music I do to reach a lot of people. When we played to be with you, Mr. Big, I look out and there's 10, 20, 40, 60,000 people with tears in their eyes or smiling. And it's unbelievable. We touched so many people, that little simple song. Then I've seen Shredder guys do the most amazing playing I've ever witnessed in my entire life. And there's 20 people in the audience, you know? And most of them are like this. So I wish that wall would come down. I wish it would. We tried a little bit with Mr. Big, because we had to be with you. But we also had daddy, brother, little, little boy, and uh, addicted to that rush. We, and we did break it down, because we saw the kids with the Slayer shirts were singing To Be With You, and the 14-year-old girls with braces were singing the heavy stuff. So we, we got close, but I'd like to see that get better. I'd like to see people, because I love all kinds of music, uh, from classical to Bulgarian choir to you name it, everything you can imagine. Uh, and I, I can listen to the heaviest, heaviest death metal and then also Frank Sinatra, you know, it, and I love them both. They both have amazing qualities. So I'd love to see people go that way more. Unfortunately, people got these blinders on and I must listen only to this and everything else is awful and we hate it all and we hate anyone who listens to it. You know, no, no, no. Peace, love, happiness. Come on, let's enjoy it. I, I, I like that. But I like, I like everything and I would love to see the walls uh, come down a bit. I understand why they're there though. The Shredders are musicians, they're players, they work hard, they, they dedicate hours, years, decades to playing and being as good as they possibly can be. Then, and, they, and they end up without much money or broke or no record deal or no nothing. And the pop people are kind of handsome or attractive people that I guess can kind of sing. And the, the music is programmed there was no drummer, no bass player, no guitar. It was all button pushing, and uh, it, it's a. Uh, and when they sing, it's all pitch corrected, so you can see the frustration of the shredder people looking at that, going, and they're all billionaires, and they're all on TV every night, and uh, and and playing at the Super Bowl, and uh, you know, uh, you see the frustration that is there, and I, and I, I my heart goes out to the shredders because and to the Prague people and people that like music that's a little more substance and played by real people and actually really sung. My heart goes out to them. All my bands have always been that way, so I understand their, their uh, frustration, and it, I think it is warranted. Uh, but uh, the pop people figured out a way to sell records and, and reach millions, so there's got to be some midpoint there. 
<laughs> anyway, I rest my case, Your Honor. <laughs> sure. Well, unfortunately, just since there hasn't been many low points at all, at any given time, I was in a pretty good situation. Maybe late 70s, left Talus for a year, uh, got another band shortly. Things were in a confusing state. It was a tough time. I didn't know how I would make it into the future at all. But I, I kept going and had it happen. And then uh, David Lee Roth thing was unbelievable. It was a life-changing, amazing experience. And then after that, we end up with a band, Mr. Big. I started the band and put some great people together and we ended up with a number one single. So that little bump <laughs> from, from David Lee Roth to uh, uh, bump ahead, uh, Mr. Big, it was pretty darn good. And now I'm so lucky. I got the Winery Dogs, Sons of Apollo, and uh, Niacin's gonna play again. A couple other bands I'm involved in, a musician, so I'm very grateful, very grateful that that's the case. And at my lowest lows, it wasn't too bad. It was tough, it was tough going, uh, but it wasn't so bad. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, I'm, I'm where I'm at and forever grateful. Oh, I learn from beginners all the time. Every time I sit down with a beginner and try to show them things, and I see them just trying to struggle through, and I see where their struggles are, and it makes sense why that's a struggle. And that will relate to something that I'm doing. Uh, when I do a clinic, I almost always learn more than the audience from the clinic when I do it, because when you have to explain things, you have to explain them in a way to, for others to understand, which means you must know them better. They say, if you really know a subject well enough, you should be able to explain it to a five-year-old, even nuclear physics. So if you know nuclear physics well enough, you should be able to explain it to a, a five-year-old. And in doing so, you'll probably learn more about how nuclear physics is than in any other way. Maybe, who knows. But uh, I, I do enjoy uh, beginner players, uh, working with them, helping them, because they say, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. So I want to make sure that twig doesn't get bent the wrong way and they're on a good solid path to a future as a musician and a, a great adventure that it is. Well, Mr. Big uh, right now is um, off. Uh, we're not, not currently active. We Sadly, our drummer passed away, as many people know, and it's been difficult to carry on without him. But a wonderful gentleman uh, filled in. Mr. Matt Starr did a great job, but it's, not, it's just tough without your original guy there, you know, it's a tough thing. So we don't know what the future will bring with that. I'd love to play with those guys in any capacity, so we'll see. I'm very lucky to have uh, the Winery Dogs, uh, me, uh, Mike Portnoy, Richie Cosson. What a great, what a riot. I have a wonderful time in that band. And on top of it, I get to play with Mike also in Sons of Apollo, which is a more proggy, uh, more elaborate band, but really just a blast to play in. And there's a bunch of other projects here and there. I've been recording in my home during the pandemic and done over 300 tracks over six albums for clients all over the world. Uh, I'm just looking forward to more of everything. Well, I think the formula for success has been proven. And everyone I, the most successful players in the world followed this one formula. And it is getting a band. Getting a band with songs. Getting a band with songs that you sing. Chris Squire, Getty Lee, Paul McCartney, Doug Pinnock, the list goes on and on. They were all in a band. The band had songs with singing. It's a great thing. Being in a band, you learn something you don't learn anywhere else. You learn to work with other people, musicians, you learn to be an ensemble player, which is essential. To play only by yourself, uh, alone in your bedroom, no one will ever hear you. And you could be the greatest musician in the world, but no one will ever know. So what, what point? Getting in a band, now much you in a, you have four or five people working together. Now you can move forward a lot more. You're going to move very forward if you have songs that people sing. And that's the, that's the trick, I think. Uh, there are players now that go out and do solo stuff, and it's great, but they, they were in a band. That's, how, that's why you know them, because they were in a band with songs that you sing. So that's the best I can do, and I think it's, uh, I think it's been proven out, again, by the numbers, by the... Uh, Paul McCartney is the richest musician in the world. He got in a band with songs that you sing. So I rest my case again. These are my closing arguments.